Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to a new session. We will uh, be watching very interesting talks today. Um, we are going to start with the first one is Sentinel Processing in REST GIS, a growing toolset for downloading, pre-processing, and multi-temporal analysis of Copernicus Sentinel data. My name is Alba Germán. I am from Cordoba, Argentina. I work uh, in a research institute in the um, uh, Spatial Agency of Argentina and the University of Cordoba. And I will be presenting uh, the session for today. The first one um, is uh, from Guido Rimbo uh, from Mundialis. Um, Guido studied geoinformation and visualization at University of Boston and worked as a trainee for ESA Earth Observation Program before joining Mundialis in 2020. I uh, will be streaming his video and then we will have another author uh, for the questions. My name is Guido Rimbauer from Mundialis and I will be talking about Sentinel processing in GrassGIS. Well, I will show the existing and growing functionality of uh, downloading, pre-processing and analysis using Sentinel data. This is the outline of my talk. First of all, I'd like to quickly introduce Mundialis and what we are doing as a company. Before, I will talk a bit about the Copernicus Sentinel program and GrassGIS and its add-ons. I will then go into detail about the Sentinel add-ons for GrassGIS and show an exemplary workflow. Finally, I would like to show some application examples of how we use these add-ons in our projects. So, we are Mundialis, we are a remote sensing company based in Bonn, Germany, and we focus on the analysis of large time series of Earth observation data and uh, using cloud environments. Mostly we focus on free data, such as data from the Copernicus Sentinel program, and we are also committed to using exclusively free and open source software. With uh, Markus Metz and Markus Nedela, we also have two GrassGIS core developers in our team. And in our projects, we regularly contribute to the GrassGIS development and the development of GrassGIS add-ons, as I will also show in this talk. Now a bit on the Copernicus program. Um, this program is funded by the European Union and implemented by the European Space Agency. And it consists of a number of different Earth observation satellite missions, each one dedicated to a specific application. And what's special about this uh, program is first that it has a free, full and open data policy, so all the generated data is free and open to the public. And second, this program is designed for long-term continuity. As you can see in the left graph, there are already successor missions planned for existing satellites that are in orbit right now. And with this consistent time series, um, we can we, yeah, we can build time series that are very long and that, that are very densely sampled in time, as you see on the right graph, where you can see that Sentinel-1, uh, sorry, Sentinel-2 already captures an image over the continents every five days. So Sentinel-1 and 2 are the most um, relevant missions when it comes to land monitoring, because they have a rather high um, spatial resolution. And it's also these two sensors um, that the GRASS GIS add-ons are focused on. So let's have a quick look on these two missions. First, we have Sentinel-1. This is an active radar mission. That means um, that the sensor can actively look through clouds, which is very beneficial in areas where cloud coverage is usually an issue. It has a spatial resolution of roughly 10 meters and typical applications are water and sea ice monitoring or agriculture mapping and biophysical parameter estimation. Then we have Sentinel-2. This is somewhat the optical flagship of the Copernicus program. It has uh, 13 spectral bands and a spatial resolution of up to 10 meters in the visible and near infrared uh, bands. Typical applications are land, uh, land cover mapping or vegetation monitoring. Now let's talk a bit about GrassGIS. I'm sure you all know it already, but let's sum up the 
main characteristics, it's a free and open source GIS software capable of vector and raster management, geoprocessing, spatial modeling, and much, much more. And it's been around for quite some time as it celebrated its 38th uh, birthday this year. And also a release version 8 is imminent. And since it's already been, so, uh, been around so long, it has also been an OSGO founding member. GrassJS offers a huge range of different uh, geoprocessing modules, ranging from simple buffering, op um, buffering modules to uh, complex hydrological modeling. And all these modules can be accessed via a graphical user interface or the command line. Also, scripting is fairly straightforward using a C and Python API. Now, in theory, GrassJS core components and functionalities are already enough to um, import and pre-process Sentinel data, but it's much more convenient to use add-ons that were designed specifically for this purpose. So there, the Grass add-ons repository on GitHub. That is, again, a number of more than 300 modules uh, that, are, that come on top and that can be e easily uh, installed to GRASS.js using the g extension command. And it's, uh, each module is very well documented, not only for the add-ons, but for all GRASS modules with a manual page describing the parameters and exemplary usages. And many um, institutions and people contribute to this repository as well, of course. Um, and yeah, it's fairly straightforward also to write your own GRASS.js add-on using the GRASS scripting library, for example. This slide now gives an overview over the existing GRASS.js add-ons that are specified for Sentinel data. And again, also here, a lot of different people and institutions are contributing and developing these add-ons. Um, they can be grouped into add-ons that are focusing on the access and download of Sentinel data, add-ons that focus on the importing of Sentinel data, on the pre-processing of data, and also on the analysis itself. Although the last point is not really specific to Sentinel data, because once you have imported and pre-processed your data in GRASS.js, the whole range of uh, GRASS.js modules is available to you. Now, most of these add-ons are uh, available in the GRASS add-ons repository, and some are also available on the um, on Mundialis repositories, but in any case, they are op publicly openly available. Now, I can't go into detail about each of these modules, but I can show you a classic uh, workflow example using Sentinel-2 data to import and pre-process it. First, access and downloading data can be done uh, using the iSentinel download module. Three different data sources can be used, not only the Copernicus Open Access Hub, but also the USGS Earth Explorer and the Google Cloud Storage. Reason for that is that data on the Copernicus Open Access Hub gets moved into a long-term archive after some time. That means that it can be a bit time, in, in, uh, time expensive to trigger a re-upload of this data, and you can simply use these other two data sources for that case. Now let's assume we have set a region of interest to Buenos Aires and are looking for Sentinel-2 data. Then we can simply use the iSentinel download routine, pass the um, credentials to the Copernicus Hub, define a start and end range of when we are looking for data. We can also pass a clouds parameter limiting the data to a cloud uh, coverage maximum and define the product type, in this case, level 2A. We then get a list of different data sets to download, which we could directly take and download them all. Or we can um, select a single one by its UUID, as in this case, and download that one specifically. Here we can also select um, the data source, which in this case is the Google Cloud Storage. And then the data gets downloaded to you locally. Once uh, data is downloaded, you need to import it into GRASS GIS. And for this, um, there exists the module iSentinel import. Here you can choose also to only import several or um, specific spectral bands if you're not interested in the entire range of bands. And metadata and band reference and all this also gets automatically imported and assigned to the raster maps. And also if there are cloud masks available, they get imported as well. Um, if you're looking at a time series, it's also possible to use the T-Sentinel import module. Now this module 
uh, not only imports the data, but it's registered, uh, it, it registers the data in a space-time raster data set. A space-time raster data set is somewhat the GRASGIS implementation of a data cube. So a stack of raster data sets that are ordered by the third dimension, which is time. So with this, you have a, a unique timestamp assigned to each uh, raster map and can perform temporal analysis as well. Let's look at this as well. So assuming we have a, a folder where all our Sentinel data lies that we can define as input directory. We can then define a band pattern that we want to import. In this case, for example, only the visible and near infrared bands. We can then also define a maximum memory and the number of parallel processes to be used in order to speed up the whole import process. And we can define the name of an output um, space-time raster data set. Now, running this command will then import all the um, data from our input directory in parallel and create new space-time raster data sets. One for the uh, one overall space-time raster data sets and the others for individual bands. We can check this using the t.list function, which gives us an overview of our existing space-time raster data sets. And we see all they exist now here and were automatically generated. And then we can use the t.rust.list method to look at individual space-time raster data sets and list the maps that are inside it. Here we're looking at the red band and you see that each raster is now assigned with an unique timestamp. And with this, we can now perform temporal analysis. Once the data is imported, um, some pre-processing might be necessary. For example, if it hasn't been atmospherically corrected yet, there's add-ons for that. For example, iSentinel preprog or iSentinel2 CentoCore, which um, employ different atmospheric correction algorithms. And a very classic example of pre-processing is also cloud masking, which you see here. This can be done by iSentinel mask. And as you can see, this add-on is capable of reliably identifying clouds and cloud shadows in Sentinel-2 imagery. Again, if you have a time series of data, you can use the T-Sentinel mask module, which also creates a time series of cloud masks. This can be beneficial because there might be the case that you have individual images of the same area, like here, where all are covered in clouds, but the clouds cover different parts of the image. For example, here again, an example from, from uh, Buenos Aires. Now, you could use here the t.rust.mosaic module to create a temporal mosaic of the data that is cloud-free. As input, we simply need the space-time raster data set with the imagery and a space-time raster data set with the clouds to generate a mosaic that is then cloud-free, as you can see here, which is more or less analysis ready now. Now, pre-processing of Sentinel-1 data is a bit of a special case because it requires a lot of geometric corrections and radiometric calibration. And so far, only ESA's SNAP software is the only open source solution that is capable of doing all these processing steps in one go. So we developed an add-on called rr.s1.grd.import, um, which we will also soon public, publicly um, publish on GitHub. And this add-on basically just takes advantage of an existing SNAP installation and uses the SNAP Python API to run all the required Sentinel-1 pre-processing within SNAP and then only import the final raster map into GRASGIS. So it's completely automatized and it includes standard um, Sentinel-1 pre-processing steps such as border noise removal, orbit file application, thermal noise removal, calibration to sigma or gamma naught, speckle filtering and terrain correction. Now, finally, I would like to show you some application examples of how we use these add-ons in our projects and what we, we do with the Sentinel data in effect. This example is a, a nationwide land cover map that we generated from Sentinel-2 time series for the whole of Germany for different years. Here we generated indices from the um, Sentinel-2 time series. And by looking at the temporal dynamics of these spectral indices, we can then get an information of what land cover type is at a specific area. 
For the classification itself, we used a machine learning approach that is already implemented in GRASS.js in the rlearn.ml2 module. And we also did some uh, change detection to monitor dynamics in settlement and infrastructure between two or more years. Another example that I'd like to show is the Hermosa project that is also presented here at FOS4G in a dedicated presentation. Hermosa is a platform for satellite-based ecosystem monitoring, and the goal is to enable local projects that commit to ecosystem restoration to monitor their effort and progress using Earth observation data and potentially link this to investors. So Hermosa comes with a set of functions for uh, using Sentinel data to assess the local state of an ecosystem, for example, as you see in this example, um, simple uh, land cover classification automatic or more complex analysis like um, vegetation dynamics throughout time, as in this case, uh, visualized by Sentinel-1 data of a time series. At the back end of Hermosa lies the geoprocessing engine Actinia, which is also featured in a special uh, talk here at FOS4G. And Actinia is basically a scalable, cloud-based API for GRASS-GIS. So all the Sentinel modules that, that we presented here in this talk can also be used in Actinia and in this way be scaled up and automized, automatized further. Finally, the last example I'd like to show um, is about flood mapping. Here we developed an algorithm that takes Sentinel-1 scenes and automatically detects flooded areas uh, using automatic thresholding and image segmentation. Using many individual Sentinel-1 scenes and generating individual flood masks, we again get a time series of flood, which we can analyze to um, calculate flood characteristics and statistics. As in this example, this is an example of the flood frequency. So what you see is essentially the number of times an individual pixel gets classified as flooded. So it's a sort of flood hazard map in, in effect. And this kind of information can then be used to report on the risk or damage and loss of natural disasters, for example, in the um, context of the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. So this brings me to the end of my talk. I hope I was able to give you an overview of the potential of using GRASS-GIS and using Sentinel data together with it. I invite you to try it out and I thank you very much for your attention. Okay, that was a great talk. Um, Guido couldn't be here with us today, so another author, Veronica Andreo, is uh, here to answer all of our questions. Welcome, Veronica. <laughs> How are you? Hello, good morning. <laughs> good morning. Veronica is also the chair of uh, Grass GIS and a co worker of mine, so. <laughs> um, Okay, let's check for questions. There are some questions. Uh, first, how well does GRASS work with stack catalogs? Sentinel-2 data seems to be available as a stack of COGS, and if you could import from stack, then it would have downloading everything. Yeah, so far um, there is no module uh, to access stack catalogs directly. This was a question that popped up the other day, like in, I think in informal chats with people in the social gathering area. And it seems like a super interesting um, thing to address and to go in that direction, especially probably in the context of Actinia, um, in which you really don't need to download locally or your data, but it will be moved like, to a distant or remote server, and you just send your GRASS commands um, or use Actinia endpoints there. So this is uh, something that um, I think it's very interesting to tackle. And if there are any volunteers to, to join us for the code sprint tomorrow, we could just be discussing this uh, and planning ahead and setting a roadmap or things like that. So please uh, come and join us tomorrow and, and we can discuss this better. It would be great. 
Thank you, Veronica. Um, there is another question. Is there support in GRASS for some of the more unusual Sentinel data, such as Sentinel-5P air quality de data, which has complicated things like non-square pixels? That's tricky. <laughs> Yeah, uh, no, not yet. There's uh, last week uh, two open pull requests to add uh, support for Sentinel-3 products in ICE Sentinel download and another pull request um, to import Sentinel-3 data as well, which also has kind of a, a complicated geometry um so there are efforts going in that direction but sentinel 5 is not yet supported it would be great to add a, a sentinel 5 as well um, so it's just a matter of discovering how to how to convert that geometry into something that we can display in grass basically and and add an add-on for that or add the product to the list of supported products. So to download, it's probably easier, but then to import into GRASS, that's the complicated part in which you have to figure out how to display that irregular geometry. But it would be great indeed. So again, yeah. join us in the code yeah. sprint. <laughs> Help us. <laughs> yes. Okay, there are, sorry, do you want to say something? Ah, there are um, more questions for you. Are these Sentinel and imagery tools parallelized, uh, making use of libraries like OpenMP, uh, for example? Um, so for the Open, the OpenMP parallelization was tackled indeed by a Google Summer of Code student that presented, I think, yesterday. So he addressed several raster modules like, but in terms of processing and not really in terms of importing data. Um, but now there is a new like environmental variable in GRASS in which you can set uh, the number of processes um, to run in parallel. And several modules uh, have this included, especially, for example, all the temporal modules or most of the temporal modules. So we are going in that direction. Um, and with this Google Summer of Code, we made like a, a big step ahead, I would say. Great. That's great news. <laughs> um, there is also a lot of interesting in Actinia presentation of uh, yesterday's session. Um, maybe uh, there is also uh, already backlab uh, shows um, Sorry, share the slides. Uh, so they are in the chat. But the people were also asking if you could share the video, maybe in some weeks. <laughs> yes, the videos will be available in some weeks. We need to process everything. There's a company, like a local company in Argentina, that will be doing all the cutting and formatting and everything. So it might take like one month or so. We will announce that. In, in social media and so on. So you, you will be notified. <laughs> Great. Also, Baklav uh, uh, shared in the chat that some of the Sentinel tools are already parallelized. So that's good. Maybe he yeah. can say something. Yeah, probably the, the processing the processing part. Thanks, Baklav. <laughs> <laughs> OK, that's great. Uh, I don't see any more questions. No, there is one more. What do you see the benefit of the tool compared to Google Earth Engine? I think probably it referred to Actinia. Maybe. Or, or, or graphs in general, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, uh, the thing is we have, okay, I use graphs, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, I will be biased in this. Um, but the thing is, we have like a lot more of ready to use tools uh, as compared to Google Earth Engine, where some simple stuff you have to program yourself, like in JavaScript, for example. Um, and so in that, in that sense, I will always prefer to use GRASS tools. Uh, and the nice thing of Actinia is that allows us to 
take all these tools into the cloud. So if you already know uh, GraphJS and you are used to it, then your scripts or your you can convert your scripts uh, into a JSON format or into a workflow of Actinia kind of easily and move your processing to the cloud um, without the hassle of learning JavaScript, for example. <laughs> um, also, so it will depend, in the end, it will depend on your budget to pay uh, the storage and to pay, uh, how to say, the, the jobs, not, not jobs, but processors uh, to run in parallel. So in that matter, it's difficult to compare. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, let me see if there are more questions. I don't see any more questions. <clears throat> also, yeah, I was thinking the same as David, uh, he put in the chat, what happens when Google shut down uh, GEP? And that's the, exactly the thing I was thinking. So exactly. if you depend for everything of Google Earth Engine and they start, uh, I don't know, uh, having yeah, problems charging. Down or charging, uh, or then charging you don't have, yeah, you don't have another tool and you're like a prisoner of them. So I think that's, for me, the main yes. uh, thing about- Yes, indeed. This is open source <laughs> and anyone can have a look at the code, modify it, you reuse it. So, and you can, I mean, take over it. If, if all of us somehow disappear, someone will take over, no? It's open source, so yeah. <laughs> you can just use it. Yeah. Um, also, Backlab said, Grass also has all the non-remote sensing tools to add. Yeah. So yeah, there Google are... Engine is just for, for remote sensing, no? Grass has all yeah. the vector data and many more raster processing and yeah, it Hydrological has. modeling, landscape analysis, time series analysis, like in Google Earth Engine, you cannot set timestamps as we do in GRASS um, or create or easily create time series. They, they, when you import a collection, they are all just there, but they are not order, timely order. Great. <laughs> uh, okay, I think uh that's all for the questions there are more uh posting in the chats very interesting information so thank you for that i like the audience is very active always in all the sessions yes. <laughs> uh so let's uh thanks veronica uh thanks, thank you very much for being here she's very busy also with the post 4g organization <laughs> so <laughs> let's thank her and big He's yeah, thanks for right. having me here. I hope I made Guido and the rest proud, kind of. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you did. <laughs> Bye, Vero. Okay, See ciao. you later. Okay, now uh, we're going to uh, continue in two minutes. Let's wait for Remy. Uh, he's the next speaker. Um, he will talk about Orfeo Toolbox teams with TensorFlow to remove clouds in optical remote sensing images. Um, this is built on the shoulders of the Orfeo Toolbox and TensorFlow. And the, so the software uses deep learning to remove clouds in optical images using joint uh, SAR and optical sentinel images. It is open source and comes with pre-training models. So it sounds very interesting. Remy, um, he works in the French National Research Institute for Agriculture, Food and uh, the Environment. He, um, his, his research and engineering fields include remote sensing images, processing at scale, high performance computing, machine learning, and geospatial data interoperability. He's a member of the Orfeo Toolbox Project Steering Committee and charter member of the OSGEO. Uh, let's wait for one more minute and we will continue. <laughs> 